Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dominique Gomez. I'm with the Salazar Center at Colorado State University. And this is our second in our series of conservation conversations. Very excited to introduce uh, our host today in just a moment. This is a collaboration of nine university centers uh, working to highlight solutions in climate, conservation, and environment. And we will be having a series of webinars over the next few months. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of housekeeping. This session is being recorded and we will share a link to everyone who registered via email in the next few days. All attendees are on mute, but we wanna hear from you and we wanna to get to as many questions as possible. So please submit those throughout uh, in the questions box on the control panel. And again, we'll get to those towards the end of the session. You can also learn more about our upcoming sessions and view past recordings at the website, which is conservationconversations.org. Next slide, please. You also are invited to view our one previous uh, session recording that's already up at that website. That was a webinar we had a few weeks ago, which was on climate change and conserving biodiversity, the Convention on Biological Diversity's 30 by 30 goal, uh, which was hosted by the Berkeley Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce Drew Bennett from the University of Wyoming, who's going to be hosting the session today. Handing it off to you. Thanks so much, Dominique. I really appreciate uh, everything you do on the, on the back end in the Salazar Center for, for making this webinar series uh, function. So as Dominique mentioned, um, I'm Drew Bennett. I'm the Whitney McMillan Professor of Practice uh, here in the Ruckles House Institute at the University of Wyoming. Uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating uh, today's conservation conversation and to have the Ruckles House Institute as the host. Um, just a little bit of background on the Ruckles House Institute. Uh, the University of Wyoming's Institute of Environment and Natural Resources was founded in 1993, and the Institute works throughout Wyoming, the West, and beyond to advance uh, the understanding and resolution of complex environmental and natural resource challenges and support stakeholder-driven solutions to environmental challenges by conducting relevant research and promoting collaborative decision-making. Uh, the university renamed the Institute in 2002 after William Ruckles House, an incredible public servant and our first board chairman. Uh, for his remarkable service to the Institute. Uh, Bill Buck Ruckles House passed away this past November, and all of us at the Institute have a high bar to live up to the standards, integrity, and the legacy that he leaves behind. Um, so I really just want to acknowledge his memory uh, today in, in, in really guiding everything we do here at the, the Institute. So today's conservation conversation is very much in the spirit of Bill Ruckles House, uh, the emphasis on collaborative and stakeholder-driven solutions to environmental challenges is in line with with the focus today, which is on reframing the discussion around conservation and as it relates to uh, rural economies in the West. You know, rural America has been undergoing some fundamental changes and economic restructuring over the last several decades. Uh, industry consolidation, technological advances that make industries such as mining, forestry, and agriculture more labor efficient to trade policy have presented uh, significant economic challenges to the rural West. Uh, the current crisis brought on by COVID-19, which has rippled through and impacted the entire country, if not the globe, has brought also some significant and specific challenges to rural America with dis disruptions to supply chains um, and agricultural, for agricultural commodities, as well as numerous other impacts. So in recognizing these challenges to rural economies, conservation is often pitted against local economic activity and development such as uh, mining and agriculture, uh, energy infrastructure, uh, and this framing of the economy versus conservation is a false dilemma in, in many ways. And clearly there are trade-offs, um, as there are in any policy or economic decision. Uh, but while the economic costs of conservation are often emphasized in public debates, we often don't hear about the explicit uh, contributions that conservation can provide. So today's focus is really on recognizing those benefits as well as some of the challenges and maximizing uh, the in economic impacts of conservation actions and investments. And we'll be considering conservation quite broadly today. So considering everything from federal land designation, uh, like national monuments, to watershed and forest restoration, to private lands conservation efforts through the use of, of tools like conservation easements. Um, and I am really excited to have an exceptional group of panelists uh, joining us for the uh, conversation today. Um, and they'll provide some diverse perspectives across a range of conservation issues and geographic 
uh, regions of the West. And so we'll re begin by having each panelist provide some brief thoughts um, and then to tee up the conversation and then we'll transition to a discussion format and questions. So please enter your questions on the control panel as Dominique explained. Um, we will not be able to get to every question during our time today, uh, but we pl plan to provide a synopsis of the conversation on our website afterwards. Um, we'll, we'll try our best to answer all the questions that we're unable to get to. So kicking us off today is, is Ray Rasker, our first of nationally uh, recognized leaders and experts in their field. Uh, Ray is the executive director of Headwaters Economics, an independent nonprofit research group with a mission to improve community development and land management decisions. And Ray enjoys working with people in communities uh, who are passionate about their place. He grew up in, a, in Mexico City in a Dutch household and came to the US as a student. After obtaining a BS in wildlife biology from the University of Washington and a master's in agriculture from Colorado State University, he went on to study economics, earning a PhD from the College of Forestry at Oregon State University, go Beavs. Uh, Ray has worked as a wildlife biologist and in the dairy industry, and he brings a multicultural background and diverse education experiences that allow him to appreciate many diverse viewpoints. And he has written widely on rural development and the role of environmental quality in economic prosperity. And he's well known in policy circles in the United States and Canada. And so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Ray Rasker to kick us off with today's discussion. Hi there, can you hear me okay? We can, Ray. Good. <laughs> um, if, yeah, if you would um, uh, start my slides, please, that would be great. I prepared three brief slides to give you, in the shortest way possible, uh, my view on conservation, uh, in particular in the West, and the role that, um, that economics plays. So let's go to the next slide. So, um, here are seven ways, and I'm sure there's more, but seven ways that we can talk about the economic benefits of conservation. And very often, uh, people start this discussion with talking about the impacts of tourism, people coming to spend money, which helps stimulate local jobs. Or they start the conversation with the role of commodity production on federal public lands in particular. Um, but there's more to it than that, right? There's also the value of ecosystem services. About a third of our water comes from national forest land. We have um, the phenomena of amenity migration, of people moving to communities for quality of life, and conservation plays an important role there. Um, and then what happened really in the last couple of decades is a phenomena of businesses deciding where they want to locate based a lot on quality of life and the surrounding landscape plays a big role in that. These businesses then in turn use the quality of life and access to recreation, access to public lands as a way to recruit talent. And then finally, there's retirement and investment income, which on average is about more than a third of all the income in any county in the US. But in some places like in the Grand Staircase Escalante area, it's about 45% of total personal income is from retirement and investment. So people who have a nest egg or people who are retirement age uh, living off social security will also decide where to live based on quality of life. So there's ways to talk about the economic benefits of conservation. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I think it's important to put this into context. 97% uh, of the population in the West lives either in metropolitan or connected counties. And what metro counties are, it's a metropolitan area with a commuter shed, so driving distance to a metropolitan area. There's the connected counties, they're connected to metropolitan areas via uh, airports. They have daily commercial service to major hubs. And then you have finally uh, the rural and isolated counties. Um, so 97% of the population lives in either a metro or a connected county. 3% of the population lives in rural counties, rural isolated counties, but that's 50% of the landscape. So even though they're a minority of the population, they represent a large portion of we would, what we would consider lands important for conservation. And these are also counties that are, have the lowest wages, the highest volatility, few high wage service industries, they're older, they're less educated. So um, we need to pay attention to rural areas if we care about conservation. 
So next slide, please. And I'll leave you with this thought, and that is if you care about rural areas and you care about conservation, you have to care about fiscal policy. Um, some of the most important political players in the West are county commissioners, um, and their job is to provide services to their constituents. So they're, they're very interested in their budget and anything that increases their budget, they're in favor of things that hurt their budget, they tend to oppose. So here's an example. This is a White House fact sheet, and this is what they said about the Bears Ears National Monument. They said, designating too much land for a national monument is harmful to the local tax base via the elimination of an unnecessary restriction of, on grazing, timber, mineral activity, and leases. So there's a strong perception, sometimes true and sometimes not so true, that uh, conservation is detrimental to local government finances. Um, so we can get into that in some more detail, but I wanna leave you with that thought that if you care about conservation and you care about rural areas, you have to pay attention to fiscal policy. Those are my opening slides, thank you. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, appreciate teeing up that conversation with some broad context there. Um, and next up is, is Brent Davies. Uh, Brent is the Vice President of Forest and Ecosystem Services at Ecotrust, a nonprofit organization with a mission of fostering development that creates more resilient communities, economies, and ecosystems. And Brent oversees the management of the Forest Watershed Restoration and Ecosystem Services Initiatives for Ecotrust. And uh, Brent has spent the last two decades working with tribes, local and regional nonprofits, private landowners, businesses, and government agencies to develop and implement innovative conservation and economic development strategies. Some of her recent work focuses on implementing the goals of the whole watershed restoration initiative, evaluating the production of ecosystem services in the greater Portland, Oregon area, uh, and developing a conservation prioritization tool for the Pacific Northwest. Uh, she is also co-leading the development of a user-friendly web-based forest management tool that will help landowners and natural resource managers visualize how changes in management practices affect the production of timber and other ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration and how the, these changes can affect revenue. Brent received a master's of science degree from the University of Washington's College of Forest Resources and plays an active role in the management of her family forest land. Brent, it looks like you also have the uh, presenter view on. You go up to display settings, you can switch that. There you go. Okay, how's that working? Looks great. Excellent. Well, hello and thank you for having me. Drew um, asked me to start off today with a brief description of Ecotrust and some of our work. Um, Ecotrust is a regional organization that works at the intersection of equity, economic development, and the environment in communities from California to Alaska. We're working to build a regenerative model of the economy that looks to nature as our guide. And this model is one that nourishes rather than depletes our communities and our natural resources. We know that we cannot arrive at the solutions we want without centering the wisdom and voices of impacted leaders. And we believe that the best outcomes are those that are community led and collectively shared. And I'm going to go to the, here we go. Next slide. We have a 30 year history of working to advance innovations in food systems, land management and regenerative business. And we do it all in partnership with individuals, communities, organizations, tribes, businesses and public agencies and a lot more partners. Our work connects urban and rural interests, like the recently formed Climate Smart Wood Group that was created with partners to bring together urban planners, builders, architects, uh, with forest land managers to smooth out the supply chain for Climate Smart Wood and make finding good wood easier. Some of our other work includes helping repatriate thousands of acres of land to indigenous communities from Alaska to Northern California, founding the first environmental bank in 1994, 
uh, coordinating the investment of more than $12 million in state and federal funds to 169 different watershed restoration projects in Oregon, Washington, and a few in Idaho through our whole watershed restoration initiative. In 2004, we launched EFM, the first ecosystem investment fund that now manages over 100,000 acres. We've also redeveloped several blocks of old warehouses in downtown Portland into multiple use green buildings, which include the Natural Capital Center and the Red on Salmon Street. This photo is the 3,100 acre forest we helped repatriate to the Coquel Indian tribe on the Oregon coast. We compiled this data a few years ago to illustrate the number of jobs created through our whole watershed restoration initiative, and I wanted to share it with you to show how jobs in the restoration sector compare to other sectors. We have a number of different projects that I think are relevant and that I'd love to share with you, um, but and these are just some of them. But today, I'm just going to highlight one, and that is the trade-offs in timber carbon and cash flow study that we published in the online open access journal Forests uh, two years ago. This study shows that by leaving uh, larger stream buffers and more trees per acre through climate smart forest practices like those uh, endorsed by the Forest Stewardship Council in Oregon and Washington, landowners are sequestering and storing 30% more carbon on average in the forest and in uh, their wood products compared to standard industrial practices. And this work has led to some really exciting research we're doing in partnership with engineers and architects on embodied carbon in wood buildings. And I'm really hoping we'll get to more detail during the discussion on that because it really shows how product demand can incent conservation. While there are numerous benefits of conservation and climate smart natural resource management at a whole variety of different levels, including the landowners, workforce, surrounding communities, the nation, and even the globe, landowners are only paid to generate just a few of these. We could create more of these benefits if we recognized more of them and paid adequately for their production. Clearly not all of the benefits can be valued quantitatively, but our community could be doing a much better job of describing these benefits and values to the public and to policymakers, uh, both quantitatively and qualitatively. There are a number of opportunities I think we have now to strengthen and expand existing public programs that advance conservation and benefit people. And many of these programs are uh, really popular with landowners. And as I said, I, I think we'll I get to some of these um, new policies, expansion of policies and programs um, when we get to the dis discussion period. And I hope to describe how we can also marry some of these opportunities with private investment. So let's see, that's, that's it. I, I hope that if any of this speaks to you, you will really feel free to, to reach out to me. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate that. Um, up next, uh, we have Eric Glenn. Eric is the executive director of the Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust, an agriculturally focused conservation organization with the mission of conserving Colorado's Western heritage and working landscapes for the benefit of future generations. Um, as executive director, Eric oversees the operations of the land trust and works closely with the board of directors and staff to ensure that there's consistent alignment with the mission and strategic plan. And Eric has facilitated more than 60 conservation easement transactions since 2008 and secured more than $10 million in grants for the purchase of conservation easements in Colorado. Eric holds a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Management from Colorado State University, a Master's of Resource Law Studies from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, and an Executive MBA from Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. Eric also serves on the Board of Directors for Keep It Colorado and is the President of the Partnership of Rangeland Trusts, a coalition of agriculturally based land trusts, and is a trustee of the Western Stock Show Association. Thanks, Drew, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about how economics can drive 
conservation and how we can use economics to have a more meaningful impact uh, on conservation uh, in the future. So Drew had asked me to speak uh, a little bit about how in Colorado we've been using uh, economics in support and defense of our conservation easement tax credit and some of our other incentives uh, that uh, are meant to incentivize conservation here in the state. And then I thought it would be helpful to uh, talk about a specific example uh, that I like to highlight because it shows how we can use conservation and, and particularly conservation easements uh, to drive community revitalization in rural communities. Uh, so for a number of years, dating back really to about 2015, the tax credit for conservation easements in Colorado has uh, been under uh, substantial review, and, and it probably dates back even before 2015 uh, by the legislature. It seems like almost every year uh, we're at the General Assembly talking about the conservation easement tax credit program, and, and we realized uh, that we needed to be able to tell an economic story to maintain that tool for landowners and for conservation. And so uh, we set out to partner with Colorado State University's uh, Resource and Ag Economics Department uh, on a series of studies uh, that now, uh, uh, there's now three studies that we've done with, with CSU's team uh, showing the impacts, uh, the economic, very hard economic data on, on conservation easements and their impacts uh, to the state and to communities. And, and those those reports have been very beneficial to showing policymakers the importance of conservation in an economic realm beyond just the realm of, of the environmental impacts that we all know conservation can deliver. And so we did a, the first study we did was in 2017 where we looked at the tax credit program and determined that for every dollar of foregone revenue, the state uh, doesn't collect in, in taxes and instead incentivizes conservation, the state receives anywhere between a 4 and $12 return on that investment, uh, which was a pretty big uh, uh, win for conservation to show, uh, and, it, and it generated a lot of support for the reauthorization of the tax credit for another uh, seven years. And then in 2018, uh, we did a study to look at the impacts of of federal, uh, uh, federal investments through farm bill programs in the state of Colorado in support of uh, reauthorization of the, the farm bill in 2018. And that report looked at 10 years worth of data in Colorado that showed $80 million of investment in federal funds generated $176 million in new economic activity in, in the state of Colorado. 80% of that was directed to rural economies. So the, that, that, that report and that data was very influential in helping us secure additional uh, funding for the uh, agricultural conservation easement program within the Farm Bill. So shifting focus on, on, on a specific example uh, of how conservation easements have been uh, successful in helping uh, rural economies revitalize themselves, I want, I want to showcase Kim, Colorado, which is a really small town, population less than 100 people in southeast Colorado, south of La Junta. And I want to focus on two families, the, the, the Beatty Canyon Ranch uh, and the Patterson Ranch, and the families that operate those, which are multi-generational ranching families. They've been in this community a long time, and, and they wanted to remain there. But the, the challenges of, of agriculture and the challenges of rural communities was was leading to, like in many uh, ranching communities, the next generation not being able to continue on the ranch. Uh, so these two families turned to conservation. The Pattersons in 2000 and the Wooten family uh, that operates the Baby Canyon Ranch in 2008. They turned to conservation as a means to keep uh, the families in the community, to bring back the next generation and give them a shot at, at ranching and staying in that community. It was very successful, and in, in, in through the conservation 
uh, of their their properties, they were introduced to funders uh, like Great Outdoors Colorado and the Gates Family Foundation. And then in uh, there we go. Then in 2011, the uh, Mustang Pavilion and Education Center in Kim, Colorado opened. Uh, and this has become the hub of uh, community activity, of economic activity in this, in this region. It hosts more than 100 events every year. It drove the reopening of a local motel, it drove the development of a new community school. And you can see from the pictures uh, up in the upper right and upper left hand corner how, uh, how this brings together uh, communities um, and brings together new economic uh, activity within within this area and it and it happened because we were able to reinvest in families who then reinvested uh, in their communities and that's how conservation uh, can play a big role and a broader role in, in in my belief in driving the revitalization of of rural economies and in in these communities and how to sustain these communities into the future. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and uh, turn it back over to Drew to, to start the discussion. Thanks so much, Eric. Really appreciate it. And, and thanks to all of our panelists for, for teeing us up here with some really thought-provoking uh, presentations. Um, I'm going to would love to, to pivot back to, to Ray's uh, initial presentation. I think you raised um, some points that I've never really thought about as it relates to conservation, and that's this focus on fiscal policy. Um, right. You know, it's uh, a little bit abstract for some of us that maybe work more closely in the conservation realm and not in the um, economic uh, realm. Uh, recognizing that there's benefits of conservation efforts, um, but you're, you're suggesting that maybe local governments are not able to capitalize as effectively on some of those investments or opportunities um, as maybe is possible. Um, do you have any specific policy changes or, or thoughts on, on how to are there ways to, to increase the ability of local governments to capitalize on, on conservation? Um, yeah, sure. So there's some very specific policy um, ideas uh, in play in the Senate right now. Um, you know, as you probably know, federal lands are tax exempt. So there's several programs to compensate uh, county governments for the tax exempt status of, of federal land that is inside their boundaries. One of them is the payment in lieu of taxes program. Another one is the uh, Secure Rural Schools Program. Collectively, they're, they're called the county payments programs. Um, historically, a lot of counties depended on uh, a county payment program that was called the 25% of gross program, which is uh, counties got to share with 25% of the gross proceeds from commercial activities on federal land. And as you can imagine, that sets up an incentive for more commercial activities because that's how you fund your schools and roads, right? So. Secure Rural Schools was passed as a way to um, uh, sort of s supplant that program and no longer have this tie between commodity production and, and school budgets and roads. Um, but the Secure Rural Schools program, unfortunately, um, it, Congress keeps defunding it or funding it at a smaller and smaller level. So county governments are constantly having to go to Congress asking to get the program refunded and reinstated. And so there's a um, something we've been working on for a long time is a proposal to replace it with a natural resources trust, uh, where the only you know, large uh, industrial uh, country in the world that doesn't have a natural resources trust. States have them, but at a federal level, we don't. So there's a, there's a bill uh, called the Forest Health and Rural Sustainability Act. It's Senate Bill. Um, 1693, uh, sponsored by Crapo and Rich out of Idaho and uh, Merkley and uh, Wyden out of Oregon. And it would create a natural resources trust. Um, so a one-time endowment, um, and then a, uh, they would then be able to pay counties um, for the federal lands that are inside their boundary without any connection to resource extraction um, and without having to go to Congress every year. So that's one idea. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'll give you some other ones. I mean, so sometimes you have some insight where you've got all sorts of economic arguments for dam removal, for example, and you can line up all those arguments and it all makes sense, but you forgot to look at whether it's an important part of the county's tax base. 
Hmm. Right. So you have to address that. Or, um, for example, in Utah, um, renewable energy production, uh, for example, in San Juan County, Utah, where the, Grand, where the um, uh, Bears Ears National Monument is, uh, there's a big wind farm, but tax law in the state of Utah does not consider that real property. So as a result, any additional property taxes generated from the wind farm have to be offset by a reduction of taxes elsewhere. So it's not a net tax generator. Oil and gas production is a net tax generator. So it sets up a dynamic for county governments to say no to renewable energy development and yes to oil and gas just because of the way the taxes are structured. Interesting. So it sounds like there's some opportunities at the federal level or some policy changes that might be needed at the federal level, but there's also state and, and possibly even some local local policy reforms that, that could better better align conservation incentives with economic development. Yeah. Yeah. Great. How about, um, I'm curious with Eric and Brent, um, thinking about fiscal policy, uh, do you hear similar sort of concerns around, say, conservation easements or um, or forest management and, and how that might impact uh, county revenues or local, local economic generation? Um, how about Eric, if you want to start first? So we, we do hear pretty consistently that uh, easements are an impediment to county tax uh, collections. Uh, but I think that's simply, in most cases, a perception issue. Um, uh, a lot of these, a lot of the places where uh, conservation uh, is taking place um, may not uh, be developed for many, many years, even if there wasn't any uh, conservation easement placed on it, uh, which gets to another issue around how easements are valued that we can talk about. But uh, the other element of this is that there's a lot of data that shows that we can reduce costs to counties uh, and the services that counties have to provide uh, by through conservation, and that and that is a benefit to uh, to counties. And yeah, I think if you look at counties uh, like Mesa County in in western Colorado, where so much of their uh, I think economic development's really been based on on natural resources. You know, if we lose those natural resources, even if they're the private lands that people don't necessarily have access to, uh, what's that going to do to your to your economic uh, development? You know, is it going to be as attractive of a place to to move and, and relocate your business? And so, I, I think we need to look at these issues much deeper. Uh, I, unfortunately, I think policymakers. Uh, and the public look touch, only touch the surface a lot of times, and that's up to us uh, to to dive deeper and show them how these make a make a real impact economically and in a positive way for their communities. Yeah, and I might jump to from uh, conservation easements to conservation land management, or what I was calling climate smart forestry in in our case, and just point out that uh, there are still um, commodity production. We're still producing a lot of uh, wood products and and other and other products coming off of forests, and it's often much more of a stable, reliable um, annual or uh, production rather than that boom and bust economy that we've seen so much in the West that can that can be really unstable for communities. So uh, if you're if you're going into a forest, for example more regularly doing some restoration work, some thinning, uh, patch harvests here and there, um, or even every once in a while, a larger harvest. It's, it's more regular, it tends to be more regular. Uh, there's jobs um, on an annual basis rather than what can be really spikes in, in economic activity. Great, thanks. Um, I do see some of our first questions starting to come in and, and somebody, it's, it's not a question, I guess it is a question. Can you share the link or location where we can find some of the reports that Eric referenced? Um, and I think we would be happy to, all the, ref, all the resources that our panelists provided uh, or mentioned, we can link to them on our, on our website. So, um, so we'll be sure to do that. Um, the next question is, um, how can economic development service providers and natural resource managers such as land management agencies meaningfully work together for deliberate strategies 
for conservation-based economic development. Um, Eric, I might direct that one to you and, and your thought on kind of how GOCO partnered with the local rodeo. Um, that might be one example, but maybe Ray or Brent, if you want to be thinking about that as well. Um, what, what drove, um, say, GOCO to, to make those investments? Sure. You know, I think they saw the investments that they made in, in, in the land and they were compelled uh, by those landowners who came together uh, and, and made an argument that if you uh, invest in the land and then you further invest in, in infrastructure and business, uh, that we can drive new economic gains in, in, uh, in these communities and we can we can bring people back to these communities which we're seeing uh, happen in places like him you know there's there's other things that have an impact on that like uh, broadband internet will be a big uh, in rural places that's going to have a big impact on on driving economics but you know if we can if we find ways to keep existing members of the community in those communities and give opportunities for their kids uh, to to stay in those communities, which they often want to do, and, and I think that's growing. Uh, you will see these communities come back, and and yeah, I think GoCo and and the Gates Family Foundation and others uh, in Colorado who are really invested in rural uh, communities see opportunities of how you can combine land conservation uh, with community development and economic development and uh, uh, and, and when you get local landowners and community members coming together and making those arguments, uh, and 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 they get introduced to these funders, then then the synergy happens, and you can see really special things occur. And, and it's not just the the rodeo pavilion in Kim. I mean, there's countless stories uh, of how you can uh, how land conservation has worked uh, in a, a synergistic manner uh, with. Uh, additional community development and, and and business development in those those com in those rural communities. I could talk about uh, partnership out here in in the west on the coast. The Northwest Community Forest Coalition has been working with a variety of different um, local municipalities who currently don't own their drinking watersheds, but are seeing a, an increasing need to gain control of the management of those, um, or at least have uh, more influence over the management of their drinking watersheds. And so have been working to prioritize the purchase of either conservation easements or outright fee title of these forests uh, that provide drinking water. Here in Oregon and Washington, it's about 80% of uh, the residents who get their drinking water from forests. And so it's it's been, uh, really important to protect and restore those those areas for the, the uh, stability of those communities. Um, some of the larger towns and cities are um, in Oregon and Washington and around the uh, country own their watersheds, but it can be difficult for some of the smaller communities in particular to buy those properties. And so there's there have been a number of partnerships, um, and I can point to several. Uh, on the coast that are working right now in partnerships and really recognizing that if these these watersheds are are cut and their drinking water supply is cut off, it also not only does it affect their their town and um, and for the drinking water, but also a lot of the tourism and economic development associated. So um, those are that's one example that we're seeing. Um, help drive conservation. Great, thanks. Um, Brent, you've highlighted with your slide a, a number of jobs that can be generated through investments in watershed restoration. I'm, I'm curious if, you know, it seems like in the political discourse, it's really jobs, 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 and that's what drives decisions. Um, I might direct this question to, uh, to Ray uh, to start off with, but, you know, I know that jobs is maybe not the, the best metric to, to look at all the time, but um, in your engagement with um, political officials, um, is that really what, what it comes down to? Is there a better case that needs to be made about the, the job creation through through conservation? Um, or or is there also a need to really balance that with, with these fiscal concerns that, that you're raising? 
you know, if 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 we could have conservation just for the sake of conservation, um, that'd be a wonderful thing, right? We wouldn't have to do all sorts of moves to come up with all sorts of reasons for how it benefits business and taxes and, and all of this. But I think we're not in that world anymore. It used to be you could pass a wilderness bill just for the sheer uh, love of nature. Um, but I think we're in an era now where you have to demonstrate economic benefit. I don't think you're going to get very far politically if you don't. Um, fortunately, um, there is a strong connection between conservation and community development. Um, so it's not a heavy lift, but what it does require is a change in mindset. And I think a lot of people working in conservation do not approach their work from an economic perspective. There are very few organizations, in fact, that look at the economics of conservation. Um, EcoTrust is one of them, where another, there, but there's just a handful of us. So I don't think we're graduating from schools, people with an interest in conservation, who come at this work with a skill set to look at it from the point of view of fiscal impact and job impact. So I think there's a huge demand for those skills. Um, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a real role that the universities can play. Great. Thanks. And, and Brent, I might, you know, pivot back to you in, in coming up with that study. I mean, is, how have elected officials, local governments responded to, to some of those numbers? Is it something that, that resonates with them or? Yeah, I can experience? tell you a, just a, a quick uh, story about that. When we first came, came up with some of those, those numbers and mapped them for the state of Oregon, how many jobs were created given all of the mostly salmon recovery dollars that had gone into various counties. So we mapped it county by county. And a colleague of mine was presenting this to a group of county commissioners from across the state. And one of them in Southwest Oregon, rural area got up and he said, well, hey, what's the, this other county doing that we're not doing? You know, I wanna get some more of these jobs. And it really, it really, um, created an incentive for him to go and reach out to some of the watershed councils and some of the local restoration groups um, and figure out how they could the county government could be more supportive of uh, salmon recovery watershed restoration grants so it was it was really nice to see that the light go off yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to this too. What, what I'm seeing more and more is, is people want to see what's the return on investment. Um, so, for example, you know, we now have uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is fully funded theoretically, um, and um, but there's potential to spend that money. And and so here in Montana, we're a state of rivers, and we're a state of river access. We're very proud of the fact that these rivers are easy to get to. There's fishing access sites. And we, in this state, have spent $50 million of LWCF money to create fishing access sites. But it's a good return on investment because anglers spend $900 million a year, uh, which in turn helps a lot of rural communities and fishing guides and others. So return on investment is something that people are really interested in seeing. Right. And if we could add um, things like, sorry, Drew, I was just going to say, if, if we could add things um, instead of just always looking at dollars, if we could look at jobs and drinking water benefits, carbon sequestration. So we're not just looking at the production of one unit of you know dollar, uh, but looking at those multiple benefits. That would be really helpful. And that really speaks to Ray's point about the need for more people um, to do that kind of work, to, to really looking at um, ecological economics. Uh, Eric, I have a, you know, a question coming in for you. Since a lot of your work relies on state and federal funding, and this is probably similar to, to Brent as well, um, how do you, we're probably headed into a time of fiscal austerity here in not too distant future, at least at the federal level, maybe not in the short term where there's opportunity for stimulus, um, but how do you think about kind of the long-term uh, funding supports? Are there opportunities to align conservation with economic development more explicitly? Um, climate policy, how do we make those funding sources more more resilient uh, going forward? 
Well, I, I think we have to use uh, ec research in, in economic studies to show how uh, these investments actually drive that return on investment that Ray was talking about and, and show that it's a significant return on investment. We're working right now on, on policy at the federal level to boost funding to the uh, federal farm bill conservation easement programs because we believe it is uh, an opportunity to provide relief uh, to COVID impacts and other market impacts to ag producers across uh, across the country. It's it's one tool, conservation easements are a tool uh, by which you can actually uh, gain conservation benefits, uh, but you can also help uh, uh, landowners and small business owners uh, stay in business, continue to produce the food uh, that we all need, and continue to produce additional ecosystem service benefits. So, you know, when you look at what, how much money we dumped into the CARES Act and some of these other things uh, in, in the payroll protection program uh, related to COVID, which was fantastic. You know, we, we were beneficiaries of that and it was really important. Uh, but I think you can you can drive additional uh, real uh, stimulus and, and some real, uh, some also some environmental gains by investing in existing conservation easement programs that, that we have proven through uh, through research and through economic analysis that they, they drive an actual positive return in hard economic dollars and in jobs. Uh, and then you've got these soft economic returns like ecosystem services. I call them soft because people just don't really understand them yet. Um, but those returns get pretty significant. And when we look at them over time, you know, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars uh, in, in return on investment um, for, for conservation. So I, I just think we have to do a better job of using economics to tell the story uh, when, when it's appropriate. Um, and we can marry the economics with the, with the environmental story and, and then it can be really powerful, I think. I might jump in there too, Drew, and just add that I, I think um, we could be doing a lot better job of storytelling in general. So using yeah. some of this data and visualizing it better to illustrate the benefits of conservation. I, I think our community just hasn't done such a great job. Um, some have done excellent job, but all of us, we could be doing a, a better job as a community of storytelling and, and speaking to communities who we haven't spoken to enough. Um, now's the time. Great, thanks. And then I'll just put in a plug for uh, Headwaters Economics, Ray's organization. They have some incredible data visualization tools and, and databases there that um, I think provide a, a really, a current, currently a great resource, but maybe there's some inspiration that can come from what they're doing for communicating this uh, conservation benefits as well. Um, one question that just came in uh, that I'll direct to you, Ray. Um, a lot of communities think tourism is the main economic impact from, from open space. Uh, but not everyone wants tourism. How do you communicate about tourism when it's not a universal desire? You know, you're, you're, you're talking to a guy who, we live in Bozeman on the edge of Yellowstone and we're inundated right now with tourists. Uh, you, you should see the entrance to Yellowstone. Uh, in, in West Yellowstone, the entrance to the park stretches all the way to the far end of town and around the corner. It takes about three hours to get into the park now, uh, just standing in line. It's crazy. So try in this atmosphere to promote more tourism and <laughs> you'll get shown the exit to town. Um, I, I always think that if we talk about the benefits of outdoor recreation or the benefits of conservation, uh, we never lead with tourism. Um, uh, I always lead with the where the big numbers are. Um, so when you look at what drives a local economy and you look at the numbers, the biggest thing you'll see that nobody notices really is retirement and investment income. It's the single biggest driver. So why are retirees in your community? The very assets that draw uh, people to recreate are the same assets that draw people to want to invest in your community and retire there, right? And that's often the single largest thing happening in your community. And then you talk to business owners. Um, you know, we work with a coalition of business owners in Montana that advocate for conservation. 
And even though there are now lots of state offices of outdoor recreation, interestingly enough, there are more state business advocacy groups for conservation than there are state offices of outdoor recreation. So groups like Businesses for Montana's Outdoors that are CEOs of companies who are telling policymakers, listen, we live here because of the environment. We recruit talent because of the environment. So that's where the big numbers are. Business location, recruitment of talent, retirement money, investment money. Um, so there's all these arguments that you can layer on. And then, yeah, tourism is part of it also. But I think if you lead with tourism, what, what people hear is a seasonal job that's low paying. And if you lead with, if you promote tourism instead of mining, here people are hearing, oh, a low paying job instead of a family wage job. So it's much better to talk about conservation from a much broader perspective. Those seven points I brought up earlier on, business location, business recruitment, talent recruitment, that sort of thing. Perfect, thanks. Um, I think this is a really important question that I wanna uh, get all of your thoughts on. Um, we're in a current moment in our country where there's critical conversations happening about race relations, um, Black Lives Matter, um, including recognizing uh, the racist histories in conservation and environmentalism. Um, do you all have thoughts on how to ensure that conservation investments are more equitable and benefit communities most in need, uh, especially uh, ethnically and racially diverse communities? And I might direct that initially to you, Brent, and given EcoTrust's uh, work with, with tribes um, in the, the areas you work in. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think my, my initial thought is um, we need to do a lot better job of asking permission um, and asking communities what, what they want and um, really looking at who lives there and who, whose land this is and um, we have done a lot of work with uh, Native communities and I think listening and being patient and um, being there, uh, showing up and um, not always doing what we want to do first, but what our partners and uh, what uh, the communities want. So really making sure to, to ask those questions and, and make sure you're listening. <clears throat> Eric or Ray, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I could add to that. Um, you know, with regards to Land and Water Conservation Fund and, and outdoor recreation, I know there's going to be more investments in infrastructure to encourage people to get outdoors and play. Um, the people who design the infrastructure need to start with an understanding of who is it for? And too often in communities, what we've seen is wonderful trails and parks that don't reach neighborhoods where the majority of the people are Hispanic, for example, where the trails reach the wealthy white neighborhoods. Um, so there's a, there's a real bias, or there has been a bias in how we develop outdoor recreation infrastructure. There's been a real bias in how we talk about conservation. Um, we all need to be aware of this. I mean, my organization is aware of this. We all need to do a better job of um, acknowledging who plays outdoors and who is conservation for. Um, you know, one out of four people in the West are Hispanic. Uh, are we addressing their needs? Are we developing um, recreation infrastructure and places to play outdoors in a way that meets their needs. Um, so yeah, it's a, there's a lot of work to be done. I'd add that you know, a lot of this is about relevance. How do we make conservation relevant to all? Uh, it, we've done a poor job, I think, historically in, in tying relevance of conservation uh, to the general public, quite frankly. Um, you know, understanding how investments in, in conserving farm and ranch land uh, is really critical to 
to food access. It's critical to food security. It's critical to clean water. It's critical to uh, carbon sequestration. And, and, and we talk about these terms like carbon sequestration. How many people in impoverished communities even know, you know what we're talking about and why that's important to them? Um, so we've got to do a better job, I think, to Brent's point of listening and, and changing the way we talk about these things and saying, you know, and showing how uh, work that's sometimes being done hundreds of miles away or, or 10, 20, 30 miles away uh, in, in with people that they don't know and that are very different from, from them still have a positive impact uh, on their lives. Um, and, and, and that's where we've got to do the hard work, right, of, of going in uh, and, and, and showcasing why these things are relevant. And uh, I, I think that's exciting work, though, at the same time, right, because you get to meet new people, uh, you get to, to tell new stories. Uh, and I think truly that everybody has a, a deep connection to the land. And if we start there, if we start with that, uh, uh, that piece where we all agree that land and these resources that we all depend upon uh, are important and how do we how do we make sure that they're there for our kids and our grandkids those are all things I think we can all agree upon and, and I think if we start with areas where we agree and we can show relevance um, you know we can we can make big impacts Drew, what I think it's just that to quickly add, I know we're coming up on time, but I wanted to just uh, share that the term conservation, even that itself, I was I was told is a real trigger for some communities. So talking about the in, environmental um, outcomes um, is something we might need to really even look at our own language. And also a uh, second point that I want to make sure to say is the shifting the uh, who owns all of the assets and who owns the land and how can we figure out more innovative uh, ways to build uh, the land base for new communities that haven't always or more recently been um, in the land ownership category, which is mostly white. So how can we figure out creative solutions like the community investment trust model? Um, and I'll leave it there. So I know we're getting close. Thanks, Brent. No, I think this is just the beginning of a, a much longer conversation that is absolutely critical for, for the conservation community to, to really take seriously uh, going forward. So, um, you know, we are, are running out of time and we haven't had a chance to get through. There's been a ton of questions coming in and we will uh, do our best to answer those on the website uh, in the next week or so. Um, but I want to finish up with giving the panelists maybe in one minute or less if there's Kind of one concrete policy recommendation that you would have to increase the economic benefits of conservation um what would that be maybe we'll go in reverse order i'll start with uh with you eric sure i, I think the biggest thing we should be looking at is uh, alternative ways to substantiate the value of what we do so i work in the conservation easement field we value conservation easements based on uh, a loss of development instead of actually valuing conservation for what it does, which is conserving resources that we need for a, a healthy future. I'll Brent? say, yeah, I'll say uh, we could start a forest carbon rental program modeled after the cropland and grassland reserve programs that NRCS uh, uh, has and they're popular with landowners. It could be pretty easy to launch and I think we could get really creative and figure out how to marry those with pri private investments. Ray? So, so magic wand, I would reform. <laughs> <laughs> I would get rid of the tax revolt for one and I would reform federal and local tax policies so that local governments benefit from conservation. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I'm just going to share my uh, screen here um, to plug. Really appreciate the conversation from all the panelists. I want to plug the next conversation uh, in our series. Um, it's being hosted by the Getchies Wilkinson Center at Colorado Law, the University of Colorado. Um, it's called uh, Another Way of Knowing Indian Tribes Collaborative Management in Public Land. And it's uh, just shy of two weeks away on Tuesday, August 25th from 12 to 1 
p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. So we'd love to have everybody join us uh, at that time. And thank you so much for uh, joining in on, on this conversation. We really appreciate it. And um, please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any other uh, comments or questions or additional resources. And please do check out uh, the website as we'll be uploading that with the recording and responses to all of your questions. Um, thank you all so much and look forward to the next conversation. Thank you. Thanks.